Defense is at the edge of a network that begins with the soldier in the foxhole and vice versa. We're trying to move from a smart push to a smart pull system. Smart push, think of a telephone. I need to know not only where you are, but what you need to know in order to convey the information. Smart pull says, I probably don't know where you are, and I certainly don't know what you need to know, so we'll use the network to provide the information for you to, uh, to gather it. The basic thing we're trying to get to is to take data and turn it into information, and turn it into knowledge, and turn it into understanding, and then into action as quickly as possible, in near real time, if we can. And the point of this, it's not just material. We're not just talking about the networks. We're talking about, you know, you have to change the doctrine by which we do business. We have to reorganize the way we are set up. We have to train our people. Obviously, there's some material pieces. There's a key leadership piece. We need to get the personnel in place to do, um, you know, to be trained to do this. And we have to have the facilities and the infrastructure to support it. So all of this needs to be evolved together in order to uh, get the objective we're looking for. The mission, I think, is more complex than a lot of people realize. It's not just war fighting. It's a mix of that, of course, plus business, plus intelligence, plus logistics, and also, increasingly importantly, peacekeeping. Uh, I was uh, in Afghanistan in January talking with uh, people in the provincial reconstruction teams working with the Afghan provinces. We did a lot with uh, the tsunami relief efforts in Southeast Asia. Uh, we've had people supporting uh, relief efforts in Darfur. All of this relies on the same network we're talking about. A point to be made is that when we do get to combat, it's a fundamentally different sort of things than one might have expected in the past. Uh, several people now talk about something called the three-block war. You're engaged in peacekeeping on one block, you're in, uh, putting down a riot in the next, and you're engaged in full-fledged combat operations the next. It's not the clear kind of distinctions that most of the planning and most of the people are used to in terms of the phases of operations. People also talk about something called a strategic corporal, meaning that decisions made by people at every level at this point get into the newspapers, get into the CNN, get into whatever, and they become sort of national issues very quickly. So in, in short, the whole structure, the whole hierarchical structure is breaking down to a much flatter, much more networked, much more dynamic organization. Um, there are a lot of things in the security field that relate to what industry is doing, but frankly there's a scale and a uh, complexity and perhaps even a sort of uh, stakes issue here that doesn't really reflect a lot of what industry has. Uh, we have people whose lives literally are on the line today, depending on the network. Somebody described DOD as being just like Walmart, except that no Walmart, okay. <clears throat> Except that every store is mobile, the competition fires ordinance at you, and Christmas comes randomly on any given day. <laughs> so other than that, we're more or less the same. Uh, we have this thing on uh, which, of course, the key to network-centric operations, you've got to have a network. And the basis of this is something we call the Global Information Grid, or GIG, since we addicted to acronyms. And... Uh, there are six major programs that comprise this gig, and it's not just material, it's also the people and processes who, who store, process, transmit, uh, pr uh, add value to information across the department. So four of the pro programs deal with the transport of information. Two, one deals with enterprise services, and I've just come from a uh, very sobering talk from, uh, uh, from Scott uh, Stender on uh, you know, vulnerabilities of network services. Um, and one deals with the information assurance of the network. By the way, I'd like to talk for about 30 minutes and then I'll open it to questions. <clears throat> um, the programs first, four deal with transport. Uh, one is a terrestrial fiber net. We call it the gig bandwidth expansion, 10 gigabit per second, OC192 fiber to the 80 largest command and control nodes around the world. That'll be full operational capability by the end of this year. The second is to extend this global network to mobile units, and that's a transformational satellite that's going to take lasers around the satellite ring to give you, again, 10 gigabits a second anywhere on the planet. Uh, one of the purposes of that is to use laser uplinks from aircraft so we won't have to use so much spectrum to uh, exfiltrate the data from the various kinds of reconnaissance sensors on the aircraft. The third piece of transport is something called the Joint Tactical Radio System. 
It's a software-defined uh, radio, software-controllable architecture, and that's designed to provide the mobile routers on the IP mobile networks uh, in order to br bring these capabilities to the tactical units. Finally, there's something called teleports that links the ground infrastructure with the uh, on-orbit infrastructure. So that's kind of the very heterogeneous uh, network we're talking about. It's 10 gigabit per second, stable, to 10 kilobit per second, very unstable in tactical mobile environments. The <coughs> enterprise service, net-centric enterprise services, is basically uh, beginning to take you to a software, uh, to a service-oriented architecture. I'll talk more about that in a bit. And then there's a whole information assurance uh, program called the Gig Information Assurance Program. We spend about $2.2 billion a year uh, in DOD and with NSA on the security of the network. One of the pieces we're trying to work on is to move from this stable environment to a tactical environment. And this perhaps is something that a lot of the commercial uh, analogies break down because we have to be able to handle uh, in very dynamic environments. Of course, the cell phone environment is dynamic also, mobile. But here with people jamming, shooting, very kind of uh, severe environmental conditions. The paradigm that goes with this is a movement from need to, need to know, which is kind of hoarding the information, I own it, to need to share. You're not going to get the value of the network until you get the information out on the network. And this is much more of a policy and a cultural thing than actually a technological thing. Um, a couple people issues come to mind. In 1996 or 7 or so, I went up to New York with, uh, and listened to a group of presentations by a series of analysts from uh, the computer security industry talking to people on Wall Street. And so you know, there's maybe a certain amount of hype in the presentations, but what I took away was we industry can provide you customer with any level of security you want. And, and, but we need from you three things. We need to have a commitment from the top of your organization that security is important. We need to have you spend the resources, and by resources I don't mean the one-time procurement of firewalls and guards, but the ongoing expenditures to maintain near real-time situational awareness of what's going on in your networks. And you've got to be willing to drop the hammer on people who don't play by the rules. And I'd say in government at this point, we've done a pretty good job at conveying that security is important. God knows we're spending a lot of money on the problem. We have not done a good job in dropping the hammer on people who don't play by the rules. It's a lot easier for me right now to get a security violation by leaving my safe open than it is by you know, posting my password on my computer or letting an unattached, unauthorized modem be attached to my network. We need to work on that. <clears throat> NSA has done a terrific job and putting together a new information assurance architecture for the gig. And this is being driven by several factors. I mean, obviously, the environment is changing, uh, the paradigm security is changing, moving network-centric operations. But we also have to pay a lot more attention to the insider threat. If you look at our major espionage cases over the past 25 years, almost every single one of them had their security clearances before they went bad. We focus a lot on the perimeter of the problem, keeping the bad guys out. The issue is we have to be able to detect anomalous behavior in the network and respond to it. I heard today from uh, Paul Simmons of Jericho Forum the term deperimeterization. And I look forward to learning more about that because I think that's some description of where we're going. So there are five concepts, you will, in this new information assurance architecture. One is to separate the protection of the information from the protection of the infrastructure. Another is the end-to-end -end protection of information through enhanced access controls. We need to have strong identification and authentication, which is absolutely critical, to being able to do a security based on rule, um, policy-based uh, access. We've got to have enhanced misuse identification. For example, Visa and MasterCard. I was in Kuwait uh, a couple months ago, and I went to buy my wife some jewelry. So I uh, swiped the first card and went through. Second time, went through and said, ah, denied. So we pulled the string on and it turned out, of course, they said, well, last Saturday you were in Virginia, now you're in Kuwait, you never told us you're going overseas, is this really you? And I appreciate that. On the one hand, I mean, if, if they can do this sort of thing on the basis of you know, hundreds of millions of transactions, why can't we do this in our network? But it was pointed out to me you know, on several occasions, most recently today, 
the problems we're looking about detecting anomalous behavior inside a military network are perhaps qualitatively different than those on um, you know, just credit card transactions. I mean, if you want to ask why is Wells trying to hack into the Secretary of Defense's computer at midnight, if you want to say why is the Southeast Asian analyst all of a sudden more interested in Cuba, and I submit that's a more complicated problem than just um, a, a transaction in a different physical location. And some of these, in fact, may not even be solvable problems. We need to understand just what the limits are of what we can do. So the fourth piece of these five uh, uh, characteristics is enhanced computer network defense. And I'll talk a little bit more in a minute about something called the Joint Task Force Computer Network Operations that's recently been set up. But basically, it's improved detection, correlation of data, and visualization of data. Fifth point is we need very aggressive research and development. Uh, these are going to be different problems. I mean, we're building really for the world of 2012 to 2015. Um, and they're not going to be solved in the near term. So first of all, we have to change, stay abreast of the changing threat. But some examples, the really high-end computing that are going on, or high-end R&D, a lot of work in quantum computing. Uh, as Feynman said at one point, by the time every uh, you know, bit gets down to an atomic scale, then you're going to be at quantum uh, uh, principles, whether you like it or not. And so as Moore's law you know, progresses, we're going to be driven to quantum computing, whether we like it or not. Some of the uh, uh, breakthroughs recently or some of the developments recently, much more control over single photons, the ability to separate electrons uh, into uh, separate streams based on their spin, the ability to uh, combine uh, information from multiple atoms onto a single photon, uh, and the building of the first quantum registry with progress made towards a quantum gate. So that's a fairly aggressive uh, uh, program. DARPA, www.darpa.mil. They have a strategic plan there, which I encourage anybody interested to take a look at. I mean, some of the things they're looking at are self-forming, self-healing networks. They've already made a lot of progress in tactical environments. There's a lot of questions about whether in these dynamic networks, um, uh, TCP, for example, is an is a acceptable protocol just because uh, the overhead associated with all the, uh, the handshaking uh, is, is so high that we may not be able to get enough throughput. So we're looking at alternatives. Chip scale atomic clocks, uh, 200, uh, increase, uh, 200 times increase in, in um, uh, power and uh, size, 300, uh, 300 in power, 200 in size. And then a lot of work on hybrid optical and RF uh, connections so we can get much more robust, smaller uh, uh, units in the field to let us uh, get around bandwidth limitations. So there's an awful lot of stuff going on, and uh, I think we're making some progress, but obviously we don't have all the answers. I mentioned the Joint Task Force Global Network Operations. This was changed last year from the Joint Task Force Computer Network Operations, because we're expressly trying to get to not just computer nets, but telephone nets and uh, uh, space networks and a whole series of different uh, uh, approaches to the problem. Uh, its responsibility is the operation and the defense of the network, uh, and it does this by coordinating and directing the activities of the network operation centers, the various components across the department, and also the computer emergency response teams. Uh, we also work very closely with law enforcement and the intelligence community. The task force, I would say, has successfully responded on several occasions to attacks, whether direct or indirect, on the DOD network. Uh, I love you, uh, NIMDA, uh, Witty Worm. Uh, we did not have significant degradations from those. We certainly don't have it 100%, but I think we are getting better at containing the events early and mitigating the consequences of people, again, where folks' lives are quite literally on the line. We're not doing this for profit. We're not doing this for uh, bragging rights. We're doing this to support people who are in the field today uh, and whose lives are on the line. Um, we've also had much better cooperation, I think, with other agencies, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. We certainly don't claim to have all the answers, and we need talented people. And that's one of the reasons why I really appreciate the chance to be here today, because you all out there you know, represent an enormous body of knowledge, an enormous amount of talent, uh, and uh, we could use a better understanding of some of the skill sets you have. My main focus, frankly, is not on the hacker uh, who's in it for sport or challenge. 
My concern is the people who want to steal DOD information and do harm, either in sort of uh, directly or indirectly, to these people who are out there every day putting their lives on the line. We do prosecute uh, lawbreakers, those caught getting into DOD networks. And so if you are going to try to break the law and hack into our nets, we will uh, try to impose legal consequences. But I'd rather emphasize today something different. It's an opportunity. The opportunity is if you want to work on cutting edge problems, if you want to be a part of the truly great issues of our time, if you want to literally write history, we invite you to work with us. Quite frankly, in my job, not a day goes by that I don't come to work and say, wow, what new and interesting thing is going on out there that I want to work on? And it's an absolutely fascinating environment, and we definitely need your help. What I would ask for is your help in reducing the noise. All the scanning, all the probing, all the attempted intrusions divert our resources from the truly serious attacks that are out there. And have no doubt, there are people out there who seriously want to do us harm and do not share the values of the country, of the freedom of information on the network. Right? There are people who want to do us harm. If you haven't taken a look at it, I recommend Scott Borg, who's done some very interesting work on the economic consequences of cyber attack. He used to be up at Dartmouth, now is his own com country, company. Really worthwhile. So, my final message is, again, we value your talents. I would like very much to learn from what you have to offer. I frankly have taken away, just from the time I've been here so far, an enormous amount of information that is really useful to me that I would not have gotten without coming here. I look forward to coming back and talking with you more on the Meet the Fed panel later on in the afternoon. Uh, and let me open it to questions. Thank you very much. Go ahead. The question is on full disclosure, and what is my... Sure. sure. What's my take on full disclosure, national security, compared with business, so on and so forth? Um, By and large, as we move to network environment, and again, I mentioned the point is sharing of information, and we do better in the long run by, by having information out there and having us, having us share it. Um, it's a major cultural change for us in terms of you know, people who've owned information and say, you know, my owning it is more important than you know, getting out to other people. Uh, and so I can't draw you a clearer line that says, uh, you know, everything to the right of the line is kept uh, hidden, everything to the left is shared. My inclination at this point is shared because, as I say, I've learned stuff today about vulnerabilities that we need to get back and work on that I wouldn't have known if I hadn't come to a place like this. Uh, at the same time, uh, there clearly is stuff that needs to be protected, and my particular focus is on uh, protecting that information that puts people's lives directly at risk which tends to be fairly perishable operational information. And then the flip side is things that say the U.S. has invested tens of billions of dollars of research and development in that gives us some kind of competitive advantage long term. That needs to be protected. And so those are the sorts of things that, that I tend to focus my concerns on rather than just saying, well, everything has got to be kept secret. Kept secret. Is that fair? The use of COTS in weapon systems? Um, let me answer that in two, uh, two, 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 pardon me? Yeah, okay. So the use of COTS in weapon systems. There's an interesting study that says that the government as a whole, federal government as a whole, now outsources more than, uh, and now pays more in contracted services than it does in salaries of government employees. And this trend appears to be one that's only going to continue. So part of the problem is that almost none of us, Gubbies, know how to manage those kinds of outsourced services. We may know how to manage a program that, where the Gubbies are controlled and delivered all. We don't know how to manage these outsourced services very well. And so 
the challenge is, is these baby boomers shuffle off the stage. What are we doing to train up the next generation of managers to do a better job of managing these outsourced services and the cots that go with them and, and avoiding more ADAs and things like that? From the security perspective, my concern is that this now means I will have almost no clue into the pedigree of the networks that we're becoming so dependent on. I may know who the prime is. I'm likely to have no idea who the second and third tier subs are and where they're coming from. And so this then leads me to a much greater emphasis on not only to the near real time situational awareness of the network I mentioned before, but on some kind of understanding of software and hardware assurance for those critical applications where you know, it really does make or break the successful missile engagement or the, the tip of the spear issues. And so we're looking at, uh, for example, we have a trusted foundry that we're building for hardware chips. For those certain applications, we absolutely have to make sure that the pedigree is right. We're looking at various ways through, um, you know, uh, com combinations of common criteria and CMM and others on how to get better software assurance involved. So I think there's going to be a, a, um, a graduation between GOTS and kind of um, uh, trusted COTS and then what's just out there in the marketplace. Because I think we're mi migrating to this much more commercial environment where we frankly are never going to know where a lot of this stuff comes from, I would tend to put more of my emphasis on uh, the anomaly detection of the network, the strong identification authentication, and the uh, response to, you know, uh, problematic behavior in the net, then I would worry about you know, what was going on in every piece of software in the system. And so you draw the line here as to you know, what's in a weapon system. Uh, if you're dealing with a fighter plane, uh, that's pretty much going to be, uh, at the very least, the uh, uh, high pedigree commercial software and probably is going to be dedicated design systems. But it turns out that for us, you know, exercise after exercise after exercise shows that the most dangerous, most vulnerable parts of our operational chain, if you will, are things like logistics and medical. And in that, you're almost certainly going to have lots of COTS products. So uh, I'd, I'd love to give you an answer as what's a weapon system. I'm more interested in what, what do you need to assure the mission to complete the job irrespective of the level of attack you're under, and that's going to be a layered process. Sir. Um, the question is, uh, how, what do I feel about how other foreign governments stand in information assurance and, and England, Russia, and China, whatever? I think we understand at this point that almost every significant operation we're going to do is going to be in some kind of coalition environment. And therefore, we have to take into account the fact that our coalition partners are going to come from very different levels of information assurance and capability. Uh, I was struck by, at one point, the, one of our coalitions when right now you have longtime partners like Lithuania, Moldova, and Tonga. So, so this means that we're going to have to, in fact, we are working very hard in developing something called MNIS, Multinational Information Sharing. And it's going to have to give you some sort of multi-level security firewalls and guards to allow you to interoperate them in some kind of a shared space while protecting those core command and control functions, say, and key pieces of data that you don't want to share. So I spend less time actually worried about, worrying about what foreign governments are doing because I don't have much control over that and rather having to put together an operational uh, networked environment where I can bring in unanticipated users. T to that effort, I would say that we, we are trying to completely rethink the paradigm for DOD to operate outside the dot .mil domain, uh, to work with non-traditional partners like the Agency for International Development, UN, uh, Doctors Without Borders, and even commercial partners in the kind of stabilization and reconstruction operations that we're seeing more and more of in what we're doing. Uh, we learned a lot from tsunami. Uh, we learned a lot, we are learning a lot from Afghanistan. 
Uh, some of you may know there's something called the World Summit on the Information Society that's coming up in Tunis. Uh, it's the second of two conferences this November, and we'll be working with the whole batch of the international community to try to look at ways we can do that. I personally think we are never going to get to the stage where we'll allow these, uh, you know, uh, pick up team partners to get inside, say, the Nippernet firewalls, which means that we have to go outside and have .net or .org type domains in which we can operate and share the information. So the uh, long answer is I'm not too much worried about what foreign governments are doing. I'm trying to set the conditions whereby we can work with a whole batch of different people in different circumstances. Uh, back there first. The question has to do with integrated attacks, uh, something like um, you know terrorist, physical terrorist attacks, uh, coupled with attacks on PBX boxes and uh, and this sort of thing. And this clearly is an area that we have to be working on and working on harder. I personally think uh, one, two, I personally think that the um, we, again my goal is to get to mission assurance, not just information assurance. Uh, coming from a Navy background, I tend to think of a ship. You know, which is built with watertight compartments, and you can still fl float with a couple of compartments flooded, and you have a starboard engineering plant and a port engineering plant, so if one is damaged, you can still carry on. You've got multiple fighting main, and you train and you train and you train and you train. So we need to take into account the fact that an attack may be just cyber, just physical, a mix of physical and cyber, and uh, work the problem in an integrated manner. Uh, this is not entirely within the domain of the Department of Defense. A lot of this comes now up in the U.S. with the Department of Homeland Security, where a lot of the cyber defense of the, national, or the defense and national infrastructure rides. So, in fact, this week I've just spent several meetings with people from the Department of Homeland Security on how we in defense and, they can, and the private sector can do a better job at coordinating the infrastructure defense on which things ride, E911, those sorts of things, to give an integrated approach. So uh, is there an answer? No. Uh, are we better off than we were? I mean, we now have, I mean, GETS worked very well. The, the government emergency telephone system worked very well on 9-11. We now have the wireless equivalent of that in place. Uh, and so you basically priority overrides in the wireless service for first responders. Uh, we've had a series of major exercises called top-off, top officials, where you bring the, the um, um, FBI and, and, and Homeland Security and National Security Council, all that together, and actually run through some pretty horrific scenarios and how the decision making would flow. So, a lot of this stuff, quite frankly, is as much a policy and a decision making process as it is the technical uh, parts of the network. And that's what we're trying to get right now while we inventory the networks and you will and find out what's available out there to use when the situation comes up. Okay, somebody's down here. Uh, there's one behind. Uh, go ahead. The question is, do we allow the implementation of software? It hasn't been internally audited. All software needs to have been validated through the NIAP to be used in the DOD um, National Information Assurance Partnership, to be used in the DOD networks. And in most cases, it also has to go through an interoperability certification through the Joint Interoperability Test Center. Well, in some of the code, there is code review in the NIAP. It does not in JIDIC, but there is in the NIAP. And then there, there, I mean, there are other things that NSA does to review code and that sort of thing. But uh, So you know, we're, we're cautious. I mean, this question goes back earlier about what do we do with commercial software. Uh, and uh, part of it is, I'm going to, Part of it is, um, you know, if we're going to use something, say, like enterprise resource software, ERP or PeopleSoft or something like that, I mean, you're obviously not going to go through and, and try to change or validate every piece of code in that, and yet we're going to be dependent on it. And so the, the question, again, is how do you detect anomalous behavior in that? And, uh, but, but for those things that are in our, our uh, on Nippernet or Shippernet, uh, we're requiring the NIAP certifications. Sir?
Uh, the question is, has anybody given any thought to preventing cell phones from being used for detonating IEDs by war dialing all the cell phones in Iraq? Uh, the, the amount of time we spend on IEDs is quite extraordinary. Uh, I mean, literally, you know, our tens of hours a week uh, on, on the IED problem. Uh, and the cell phone issue has actually come up a lot. Now, there are ways to get to cell phones beyond just war dialing. I mean, there are different ways to, to get to them. And so that problem has been addressed. I have to tell you, um, uh, there's, there's not a lot of evidence that cell phones per se have been used to trigger IEDs. And there's much more stuff on garage door openers and those sorts of things than cell phones per se. But uh, I guess all I can say in this forum is we understand the potential threat of the cell phone. The guys are spending lots and lots of time on, you know, when we see it being used like this, how would we counter it? I haven't heard war dialing specifically as suggested of a way to do it, but there are other kind of electronic ways they've been looking at, at countering it. So it's a, it's a, there's nothing, frankly, of a higher priority issue for the military right now than addressing this improvised explosive device issue in Iraq, because that's what's killing our people. Uh, let me see, is there anything back in the back? I'll get to you in a minute. Sir. talking about Ada? The question is, the DOD has spent a lot of money to develop Ada. Uh, we're not using it. Other people are. Is there a way we can bring it back? Um, let me take that for the record and go back and look at it. Frankly, uh, uh, my, my sense is that time has moved beyond Ada. Uh, but uh, and there are lots of other ways to do business, especially if you go to the net centric environment. So I haven't paid a lot of attention trying to revitalize it. If you want to give me your name later on, I'll, I'll take it for the record and get back to you. It, it just hasn't been something I've focused on. Uh, Someone here? Uh, Yeah, the, the question is, what's the ratio and the number of IEDs, improvised explosive devices, that are being detected and disarmed before they are uh, exploded? And the answer is, yes, we have those data. I'm not sure I can share that. Um, wh what's happening, though, is that we're getting better at detecting them and disarming them, but they're making them more lethal, so each one causes more attacks. I mean, using uh, explosive-formed uh, uh, jets and things like that as opposed to just a... a, a, a you know, focused explosive jets rather than just a, a circular explosion. So, anyway, it, it's, a, it's a typical dynamic of offense and defense. Right. Sir. And what kind of scorecard? Assist. Assist? Yeah. So the question is, is there anything like an assist scorecard, and what are we doing with guidance for the private, sec private sector about implementing data tagging? I'll get you next. Um, and I would say that we, we, we're doing, I mean, a lot of our work is based on various kinds of balanced scorecards. We're trying to put together uh, metrics. Right now, the deputy has challenged us on getting metrics for the information assurance world. And I have to tell you, this is one of the hardest problems I've got. And this is something I would really ask for your help with. The question is how you measure in return on investment on information assurance type things. So if I'm going to go in and uh, put you know, $100 million into some sort of uh, uh, technique to get to better multi-level security in 2012, uh, and the budgeteers are out there saying, well, you know, show me... That's, that's going to give us a 14 or a 22 or a 71 percent increase in security. It's really hard to do that. And so the idea of the link between metrics and investments and all that is, 
is, is a hard problem for us. I mean, I can go through right now and measure what's working in different network operation centers and all that, how we're doing on implementing vulner known vulnerabilities and all that. Uh, I'm more concerned about the long-term return on investment metric. With regard to the public-private sector, again, a lot of this lies in the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and part of the problem we've had ever since PDD-63, which is the critical infrastructure protection last, uh, in the last administration, is building the trust, if you will, to be able to, for two-way sharing of information. Um, we've got, spent a lot of time working with Congress and others on trying to change laws so you can provide better protection to proprietary information that comes up through the, uh, th through the ISACs, these information sharing and analysis centers. And we're trying to work with getting the government being more willing to share sensitive information on the way back down. If I were to say anywhere, I think the, the um, telecommunications sector, the National Security Telecommunic Advisor, Telecommunications Advisory Committee, that process is working pretty well in the telecom sector. Um, I don't think it's working as well in, say, transportation or energy or others. And what's coming to be a concern for me is, as SCADA, as the uh, you know, Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition Nets, become more and more a part of all of our critical infrastructures. Um, we're only getting the... Um, we're, we're making the most progress in the telecoms and the um, ISP world, and I don't think we're getting as much progress in controlling the information technology in these other sectors where it may be equally critical to us on a national basis. So the answer is, uh, one piece of advice I would have is that DOD and the Intel community have committed, I mentioned the global information grid and the programs. There are three other pieces that go with that. There's a network operations, network resources management piece about how you balance the, you know, the use of resources of the network. There's a spectrum management piece, and the key underlying bit is the net-centric data strategy, which is an XML-tagged approach to the problem. Um, and it turns out that you, DOD and the intelligence community and NATO have almost identical net-centric data strategies. Uh, and we've really had some very good luck over the past several months in moving towards a service-oriented architecture approach and a uh, shared situational awareness. That data strategy has not yet been adopted by the Department of Homeland Security, which means it's not being infused into the private sector through those channels. And over the past week, we've actually been working hard with the senior le leadership of DHS to get them to adopt that kind of a strategy. So maybe that'll be an answer to one part of your question. Okay. Um, yeah. The question is, as warfare goes net-centric, how do you um, envision managing security, connecting together what used to be standalone systems? Um, I don't think there's ever going to be a closed forum solution where you lock the door and say, we got there, uh, let's go, go home, turn off the lights and go home. Uh, it's the, the, there are just too many dynamic pieces of the puzzle in terms of not only the evolving threat, but the rolling out of new technologies. I mean, there's a very good session this morning on vulnerabilities associated with XML uh, and service-oriented architectures. You know, three years ago, we wouldn't have paid any attention to that. Uh, and so now we need to fold that into the process. So I think it's going to have to be an ongoing dynamic uh, you know, series of, of reviews. Uh, the, the first key part of this is cultural. And if you talk to the intelligence community, they have a concept called ORCON, originator controlled, which basically says, I wrote the information, it's mine. Um, and so just trying to break down the stovepipes to share that uh, becomes much more an issue of politics and culture than it is of physically getting the bits and bytes to work out. Okay? So I think it's going to be a mix of cultural solutions, this doctrine organization training uh, evolution, the, uh, the physical, and even if I could give you a solution today that said I'm at the 95% level, I'm happy with it, uh, it won't be that way tomorrow. The one thing I would say in DOD that, again, I, I look for your help on, if I'm a credit card company and I'm willing to, um, and I realize that I'll probably get 3 to 4% loss rates 
uh, in fraud or whatever. I can factor that into my calculus. I can put that in my interest rates. I can, I can factor that in. And what you get from that is an explosion of credit across the economy that transforms the ability of everyday people to buy things they never would have been able to buy before. Okay. I don't know anybody lately who's gone to the top secret control officer and say it's okay to lose 3% of your documents a year. Even though in the net centric model, you might have, you know, you, maybe 100 people were lost because some piece of information were compromised. Maybe 10,000 were saved because the fight was over in three days rather than three months and, and the value of net centricity had an upside. So we need to think through our cost benefit analysis to put more emphasis in the military on the upside benefit even as we focus on the cost. So. Not, not, not a neat, clean answer, but it's, it's, that's where we're looking at. Over there, sir? Do you have a... Do you? Okay. Please. Critical factors in my going? I mean, how I got to be CIO? Um, I'm sort of a, in a strange situation in that I was career Navy, and so I spent 26 years in uniform, uh, and, then, um, and then about seven years in the Office of the Undersecretary to poli uh, for Policy, working largely on uh, the interface between policy and technology issues. And so when uh, 1998, the Secretary decided to beef up the role of the, of the, the Assistant Secretary for Command, Control, Communications, and Intelligence, which is what it, this, my organization was then known as, uh, I was asked to go over and be the principal deputy in that organization because I had an understanding of you know, less the technical details and the, the balance between policy and technology. I mean, my own, my own education is, uh, my undergraduate work was in physics and oceanography, my master's is in applied math, my doctorate's in international relations. And I found that mix of a policy science and engineering science to have been a really valuable combination. So, so just a long story, what's happened now is um, my permanent title is principal deputy. Uh, our assistant secretary left about uh, 18 months ago, and so I've been acting as the CIO since. But I think in my case, it was less a, you know, certainly wasn't a commercial background, it was less a technical background than having the policy technology interface understanding. Please. The question is, I've been focusing a lot on information assurance, um, and as you play out 2012, 2014, how do I see the offensive side uh, playing out of uh, information operations? Uh, I'm really limited in what I can say on that uh, in this venue. But I think the, 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 one of the key points is, as the network becomes the center of gravity, for military operations. I mean, right now, we're probably the most net-centric of, uh, of any military in the world. It's a model that's being adopted by a number of others as well. Uh, as more and more countries come to depend on the network, then how you attack that network, be it a physical attack or a cyber attack or, or whatever, uh, will become a more important uh, thing to work on. And I think also what I would expect to see is not just a you know, and not just a single solution, but a broad, it'll, it'll become a target just like anything else. And one of the things we're saying is we need to fight the network like a weapon system. You need to think of it as a ship, tank, an airplane. It's a critical component. And so as a result, you have to defend it against the full range of threats. And we have to be able to, you know, similarly mount the full range of threats. That's probably about as far as I can go. Somebody in the back. I'm sorry, I can't see hands back there. I'd be glad to... Yeah, please.
It's a really good question. It's what about cyber attacks and penetrations that originate from foreign countries and how do we prosecute them? Um, I think, as most of you know, the attribution of a cyber attack can be a really hard thing to do. Uh, and so, um, it, it, with a number of countries, for example, in Europe uh, and the uh, Interpol and uh, uh, a number of bilateral agreements, we now have some pretty good uh, mutual law enforcement rules to be able to address, uh, the, uh, for instance, the UK. There was a uh, UK will either prosecute people who hack into our nets, or in some cases, we can extradite them to be prosecuted here. There are other countries where, frankly, it's a free ride. If you hack from there, there's no. Some cases, it's not a um, uh, not a crime uh, to the hacking in those nations' laws. And if we don't have agreements with them, there's not much you can do about it. So I think over the past 10 years, we've made a lot of progress in working out multilateral and bilateral law enforcement agreements, but it's certainly a patchwork quilt around the world. Yeah. Sir. The question is on these uh, countries that are not doing a good job in policing their own cybersecurity or which we don't have agreements with, are there other ways we could put pressure on them, uh, postal agreements or something like that? To, and the answer is Defense Department doesn't do – that's not our thing. That would be the law enforcement or State Department. When we have the Ask the Fed panel later on, if you come, that would be a very good question to ask for the folks who would be here because be people who could address it. Um, back there first. No. What does IPv6 capable really mean? We've set a goal of 2008 to, to implement IPv6. And it's going to be done through a technology refresh policy rather than a, a big bang solution. And so I would guess we'll be running dual stack for a long time. Um, the, I, mean, I guess, t tell me more about your question, because what we're essentially saying is any, anything that we're buying since uh, last year, or 2003, I think, should have been IPv6 capable, and your question is, that, that's an ambiguous definition? I see the, you know, the, imp the rollout of IPv6 is going to be a... a you know, we're pushing as hard as possible. And there was just a congressional hearing that was basically saying that, DO, that the government as a whole should be doing more with IPv6, and the DOD was really the only organization that was taking the lead. And so the Congress seemed fairly happy with what we're doing. At the same time, as you know, there, there are lots of issues associated with it, uh, what kind of costs are going to be imposed, how much, uh, uh, how quickly we're going to retire the IPv4 systems if they can't run dual stack. So I don't think this is going to, you know, on the 20, 31st of December 2008, there's not going to be a magic, uh, magic cutoff. We just we try to get there as fast as possible. Most of it's going to be new equipment we buy, data we refresh are going to have to be IPv6 compatible. But um, we can talk later on if you want. I don't think that's answered it. There was a, yeah. By the which project? Actually, no. The question is, can I comment on the achievements of the DETER project? And I'm not familiar with the project. What, give me some more background. It, uh, the, it's an NSF DOD funded um, um, uh, test bed, if you will, to look at the internet. Actually, I'd like to learn more about that because we're in the process right now of, of assembling a, a, an end-to-end -end 
test bed for the global information grid. And we've been going around inventorying, if you will. For example, I'm funding something at the Naval Research Lab that's an end-to-end -end test bed. The Joint Forces Command down in Norfolk has an end-to-end -end test bed. Uh, Army has one out at Fort Hood. So I'd like to learn more about where a detour goes because I'm not familiar with it. Uh, yeah, that, uh, right. question is why are we moving towards IPv6? Um, well, we need the uh, you know, we need the security and the mobile the mobile environment features of being able to automatically establish uh, uh, you know, links with adjacent networks, those sorts of things. Uh, the security, there's a sense that the rest of the world, China or whatever, is, is likely to move to it. We're certainly not doing it because right now we're constrained in IP address space, but the department is going to be explosively moving to unattended ground sensors and unattended, uh, uh, well, mainly ground. And that's going to start using up our, tents, our, our space. We were trying to not have to go to NATs for some of these subnets, so that was essentially the reasons that drove it. The question is, how much collaboration do we do with other agencies on information sharing and information security? Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, we in the intelligence community and um, NATO have a very close relationship based on the fact we have a common data strategy. Uh, and that's, uh, NATO has something called STANAG, Standing Agreements, and in fact we've tried to base a lot of our policies and technologies on NATO STANAGs, so it's not just a U.S. only and we're actually trying to show it's an alliance uh, event as well. Uh, I think there are still some major cultural differences in here, especially with the intelligence community, in terms of some of the stovepipes that have been around for a long time, and they probably feel that we're moving too quickly to need to share or vice need to know, and we probably feel that, that we'd like them to put some more information in the network faster. So. Uh, the, the discussions are ongoing continuously. Uh, the, the president signed an executive order last uh, summer mandating the sharing of terrorist information across the government. The um, legislation that set up the uh, director of national intelligence amplified that to actually set up a position within the DNI's office as a program manager for information sharing. So there's just a lot of energy in this, and we're just trying to pull it together across the messy processes that are the U.S. government. Okay. Yeah, the question is, uh, do I think there's enough control by the government over the Internet, not enough control? Um, you know, th this is going to come up in, uh, in the WUSIS, in the World Summit uh, in, in Tunis, and we're working out the, the various positions. I think, by and large, the U.S. is willing to see more role in Internet governance by other countries, but we're not willing at this point to, to give up some of the key features like ICANN and, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, the positions, frankly, are still uh, being refined, but... Uh, Um, let me see. I, for, first of all, I can only speak for the Department of Defense. And, and from the DOD perspective, uh, I have no problem with the, with the current level of control of the Internet. I'll, I'll defer. It's a good question for the, for the Ask the Fed panel, because the law enforcement people might have a different view. Okay. We have, please. The question is, there's a need to keep a 10- to 15-year focus on information assurance. Uh, the concern that recently the DARPA funding for the longer-term uh, computer science projects has dried, dried up. What do I think about that? 
Uh, I mean, I know there's been a conscious effort on the part of DARPA to focus on projects with more, um, what do I want to say, direct return on investment from the R&D. Uh, there's always going to be a tension between what the, the 10 or 15 year problem is and what the local one is. Um, candidly, uh, the, uh, candidly, I've more or less accepted the view of the director of DARPA where he should put his resources. We're doing a lot of work not just with DARPA but also with NSA and also with the academic community in terms of the long-term projects. And at this point, I have more problem with the point I made earlier of how to justify what I believe should be a higher level overall of, of across the board in information assurance projects rather than uh, whether DARPA is not doing enough because there are ways to cover that in, in other areas. So that hasn't bothered me particularly. Uh, Ma'am, I got you. I'm sorry. The question is: We work without, as we work outside the dot mill domain. Um, you, the the areas, the ones I cited, were uh, non -trad non non traditional partners within the U.S. government, like USAID, with whom DoD hasn't typically worked. Uh, international organizations like the United Nations. Some. NGOs, and I cited uh, Doctors Without Borders because there are a whole raft of them, and, and some of these in the past have actually had in their charters that they should not work with the military. And I think one of the things that we've made some progress on over the past year or so, particularly since tsunami, is a recognition that if we really are going to provide services to you know, people in distress, and frankly from my perspective, I'm just talking from my DOD hat, I'm interested in the stabilization of these situations so they don't turn into problems where the military has to intervene. So in those type of situations, we have a common interest. And that was the, I just used the Doctors Without Borders in the example of a broad class of non-governmental organizations. Absolutely. NGOs are a group we're actively uh, courting. Hmm? Yeah. Okay. You had something here, right? Right. And the question is, have we seen anything similar to TPED, the Trusted Product Evaluation Program for Military? Yeah, for, for uh, you know, power grid and banks and other critical infrastructures and things like that. That's a very interesting question. I hadn't thought of it. Let's, let's talk afterwards because I think, I think you could do a lot with that, but, um, uh, but we need to uh, you know, work that through this messy interagency process, and I haven't tried to do that. I'm getting a sign here. I think maybe two more questions, and we'll have to call it a day. question is information assurance and contractors, how does that affect security when information assurance isn't part of their award fee? And, and one of the things we've got to learn to do better in this outsourcing of, of um, services is to write our contracts smarter. And I was out in Afghanistan uh, earlier this year and the contracting officer's representative for the 25th Infantry Division in Bagram was actually down in Gutter and if they wanted to do combat operations after hours, they would have to call gutter and get money added to the contract in order to conduct the operations because we just hadn't written the contract right. So it seems to me in this environment we've got to write the contract so that information assurance becomes part of the award fee structure and uh, we're not there yet. This is a learning process. Okay. Any more? Thank you very much. I appreciate the chance to talk with you today. Come work with us. I'd love to uh, draw on your talent pool. Thanks again.